Okay, it's Thursday and it's uh, two o'clock, and uh, that means it's time for Global Connections with Carlos Suarez. And we have a surprise for you. We have Carlos uh, by Skype, and uh, he's uh, in Hungary, in Budapest, and uh, it's two o'clock in the morning for him, but he's faithful to the 12 hour clock. And he's going to talk to us today about his trip to Budapest and elsewhere in the soft underbelly of Europe. Carlos, thank you so much for staying up late or getting up early. Well, thank you, well, thank Jay. You, Jay. I'm, I'm, delighted I'm delighted to join you here today. today. It's, 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 a, it's a, a great experience I've been having here and, here and look forward to just sharing, sharing with you and, you and our listeners. Our listeners. Uh, it's a program uh, I want to title Democratic Transitions in Post-Communist Europe. Uh, I'm here in the region of Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, it's you know an important time right now where they're celebrating about 10 years since they joined the European Union. Many countries will we'll speak to some of that. But also, as you know, it's 25 years since 1989, the big pivotal watershed year for this part of the world, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. So I look forward to, to sharing some of what I'm doing here. Well, tell us why you're there. Well, it's part of a, what's called a, an international faculty development seminar. As you know, I'm a professor here at Hawaii Pacific University. And uh, an organization out of uh, Portland, Maine, uh, CIEE, Council of International Educational Exchange, they, they put on a number of summer programs that are essentially a, like a, you know, an intensive seminar for 12 days. Uh, and so I'm here six days in Prague, Czech Republic, six days in Budapest, Hungary, and looking at these, uh, you know, issues of transition. Uh, the program is very, you know, rich uh, with a lot of uh, site visits, interviews, meetings with a lot of different people and, and different types of organizations, government, NGOs. And so just giving us a snapshot of really this transformation, radical transformation that's been going on in this part of the world. Who's, who's there with you and why are they, why are they joining you there? It's a, uh, it's a small group. Uh, there are six of us. Uh, all of us are college professors, uh, five others that are from different colleges on the mainland, all, all over from New Hampshire, from uh, Iowa, from uh, North Carolina, Texas. So um, we come together simply as a, as a group of academics. All of us are basically interested in this area. We either teach about it already, research about it. So it's kind of like an intensive crash course. Um, and a chance for us to just kind of dig in deeper and, and, and really understand the issues from, from the ground here, not, not the textbook, but really getting to see the hands-on. Do you know them? Do you, have you met with them before? No, no, in the uh, all, so each of us, we individually applied uh, for the program. You have to apply and get uh, accepted into it. And, uh, you know, and so this was, I think they run, gosh, anywhere from about 15 to 20 uh, uh, every year all over the world. There's a you know, handful of them in, in Europe. This particular one is in two countries, uh, Czech Republic and Hungary. And so they, they put it together. Uh, this organization is out of Portland, Maine. They're one of the largest uh, sort of study abroad providers. They do programs for students, but also in this case for faculty. Are, are there any students there with you in the program? Um, not in this, but but this uh, the host institutions here. This uh, they have study centers here in both Prague and in Budapest. They they basically host programs for students. Uh, I'm here with only the faculty. It's a small group of us, the six faculty. Uh, but there are students in programs that this organization also hosts here. They can come often for the full semester. That's more typical. But they also have some other summer programs. Well, it sounds like it's uh, you know lush with information that you wouldn't otherwise get. Uh, and that you could read the uh, internet and the newspapers all day long and never get the, you know, the true gestalt of what you're getting when you go in person and talk to people and sort of smell the roses, as the case may be. Um, oh, absolutely. And I mean, this is true, of course, for myself here as, a, as, you know, as an acting, you know, academic professional, but the same goes for any, you know, students. Today we have, of course, uh, we encourage a lot of our students to take on uh, opportunities like this to study abroad, and you simply can't replace that. You can study all you want from a book, but meeting people, interacting with them, uh, you know, it could be from the taxi driver to the hotel receptionist, but uh, as well the, the subject matter experts that we get to, to talk to and get formal briefings. Uh, probably what I think is most important, and this is again true for anybody, is really those more informal uh, chances, having a lunch with somebody, going to a, you know, a cultural uh, you know, event of some kind and really getting to talk one-on-one -on -one with people. That, mm -hmm. That's really where you get uh, the fuller picture. Well, you've been there before. I, I, I recall you mentioned that. And I guess my, my question at this point is, can you give us uh, impressions of the place? Uh, you know, hold, hold up on the academics for a minute. Just tell us what it's like there and what kind of impressions and feelings and, re, you know, reactions do you have by being there? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, my own early background was in Latin America, so I, that's a region of the world I know well. But about 10, 11 years ago now, I first came to visit uh, Central Eastern Europe, this region that I'm now focused on. I would say the big impressions are it's astonishing, uh, especially these cities of Budapest and Prague. They're cities that when you see them, the Today they are very dynamic. They're you know incredibly uh, rich in in architecture and art. And and what's such a paradox is that they went through a dark dark period of 40 years of communist rule. When in fact you know the same sort of let's say built environment and buildings were here, but it was a very gray and dark time. Today it is so bustling and booming. Now, as I'll speak to a little bit later, I mean there's a lot of mixture. I mean the, the whole process of integration into the European Union, it's been very good for some, but it's also got a lot of social challenges. And so there are, you know, underneath there certainly are some some challenges. Uh, I'll speak to some of those. But in general the impressions are an amazing city and 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 you know a vibrancy, a dynamism. Um, but more than that, it's the rich tr heritage because these are two cities that, when you see them, uh, like several others, but particularly Prague and uh, and Czech Republic and Hungary, Budapest. But you could also say Vienna, Austria. Today, they're relatively small countries. Each of them has about 10 million. But these are cities that reflect huge, huge, you know, rich empires in the past. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire, for example, and even Prague. Uh, these cities obviously have centuries of, of just a lot of heritage and, and today they've been restored and they are on the map as very dynamic places. These are the places people are coming to, let me, let me assure you that. It's busy and very dynamic. Yeah, well can you give us a little geopolitical history just to know we, we know what the crossroads are. This is soft underbelly. It had a very rich history a few hundred years ago. Uh, it's had some yes. troubles, of course. Um, but what, what, what is it? What is the, what is the the building block on which all of this happens historically? Yeah, and I think probably most immediately would be to say, look, this is a region that um, today we call it Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, I mean, uh, that's the kind of terminology. But uh, for part of uh, much of the 20th century, this was part of what we would call the East Bloc, Eastern Bloc, uh, the divide of the Cold War after World War II, of course, uh, had this part of the world falling under the Soviet Union, uh, to Czech Republic, which was then Czechoslovakia, together with the current Slovak Republic, and Hungary, uh, countries like Poland, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, these were all pretty much hardline communist countries. Uh, and so as such, they were like outside of our, you know, sort of, let's say, sphere. Uh, and they, they were under a very, very tough uh, environment for the period from the mid-40s, well, late-40s, up until 1989. Now, before that, you have this just tremendous rich history. Uh, primarily, the region was dominated by the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, during much of the 19th century and early 20th. Mm -hmm. After World War I, you saw the beginning of, of the, the rise of some of these states. Uh, uh, Hungary and Austria, of course, went from being a big empire to pretty small states. And Czech Republic uh, emerged for the very first time in 1918 as a new country, Czechoslovakia. Uh, that would later split in 92 to become Czech Republic. But uh, I guess I would just add that, you know, the challenge of some of these places and some of the social challenges that remain today is that you have lots of territories that were carved up and where many people were left in different sides of the borders, if you will. Uh, you know, Hungarians and Romania, you know, uh, lots of uh, uh, different, let's say, just, you know, challenges there. And th those issues remain. Uh, but uh, these are countries that after 1989 are now part of the what we call the new Europe and they have now fully integrated into the Western European alliance if you will the European Union they're part of NATO now so they're part of the military alliance with the US and Western Europe and they are quite dynamic because they're the last 10 years in particular has seen a real uh, well the last 20 years a, a real a high level of investment especially from Germany from Austria should we should we not distinguish them from you know the Western Europe and Western Europe, in mean, France, uh, Spain, uh, Britain, uh, Germany, I suppose? Um, how are they how are they different from those you know traditional yeah. Western well, European countries? You know they certainly are somewhat less developed in terms of let's say per capita income, in terms of uh, the size of their economies. Uh, they remain somewhat behind. Uh, you know you could say seventy five percent, eighty percent. Uh, they are doing very well. They, they've come a long way in the last 20, 25 years. But the fact is, Western Europe really has uh, a much higher standard of living in general. Uh, these are countries that are 
rapidly changing. So if you compare them, let's say, to the farther east, countries like Ukraine and Belarus, they are by and large, you know, practically first world countries. Uh, so they're, they're definitely developed, consolidated democracies, pretty good functioning market economies, sort of mixed economies. But nevertheless, they are less developed than the West, uh, uh, countries like particularly, you know, uh, well, whether you're talking about Germany, Norway, Scandinavian countries, I mean, those are just much higher level of development. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are their economies and, uh, based around? Uh, what, what are their primary you know, it, industries? It's a mixture. Um, uh, many of them have, a, a particularly Czech Republic, was very heavily manufacturing and industry. Uh, the same with Hungary. Uh, Hungary, perhaps a little more agriculture, but that has all been restructured. And so while they remain, you know, a mixture of manufacturing, uh, increasingly you see more service uh, sector industries, banking, finance, most of it foreign uh, from Austria, from uh, Germany, etc. But um, still a mixture of manufacturing and uh, and some agriculture. Uh, some of the heavy industry of the past days of the Cold War, you know, sort of communist days, those have had to be really closed because they were very, very inefficient mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, polluting. So they're trying to make this transition. But the fact is they remain a cheaper labor market. That's why a lot of the investment comes here from the West. Uh, the labor costs remain low. And so that has helped to stimulate here a lot, a lot of the foreign investment. Do they have uh, people coming from other countries looking for jobs? You know, I mean, every, every country in at least northern Europe, and, and to add Spain and France as well, um, yeah. has a lot of immigrants coming looking for jobs, and it actually helps those economies. Uh, particularly, yeah. you know, I read about uh, in Britain. Britain has a huge inflow of people looking for jobs, and, and, the, uh, and the UK uh, economy is doing very well. So yes. uh, uh, what's yeah. happening, you know, in, uh, in Hungary and uh, the Czech Republic? Well, for, I would say first, it's not not huge waves of people coming in. There are some some low low wage uh, you know earners that come from the east, from Romania. But in fact, uh, it's interesting. The, you know what you had initially in the early days of their opening to the west was a desire of many of them to go to seek opportunities outside. Uh, it hasn't been easy because uh, you know the, the other countries have often had restrictions. But today, in fact, in the last five years now, they're pretty much open borders. So the, you know, citizens of these countries can really move to other parts of Europe quite easily. I think what I would say though is that you you have a mixture: young generation, young you know recent college graduates. They do seek opportunities in some other countries of, of Northern Europe, of Western Europe. But in fact, there's, there's quite a bit of dynamism here. These economies are, are doing reasonably well. And so those who are skilled, educated, globally connected, really are, are a part of the population here that are doing quite well. What I've also seen, and, and, and I think it's reflecting the dynamic changes, is what you see are people from other parts of Europe, from Northern Europe, from you know the, the Netherlands, from the UK, who find opportunities here because they have special skills and moreover there are a lot of the investors you know germans and, and austrians so some of those are here working for the firms that they represent uh, but there is in general much more mobility of the labor markets and you don't have a flood of people leaving this because these are places here uh, this this region that's doing reasonably well quite dynamic for, especially for young populations mm -hmm. yeah I, mean, I had some uh, passing contact i think it was uh, hungry with some uh, young programmers, internet programmers, app developers, if you will, and they were very hot, and they spoke English. Yes. And they were globally minded. You know, they had, they had yes, very yes. broad vision, and uh, they Absolutely. were going somewhere. And there were a lot of them. They were together. They were a, a whole community of kids. I shouldn't say kids. They were in their twenties. You know, it, it's fair to say that the younger population, those that are under 30 today, I mean, they are all pretty well connected around here. There's a lot of mobility. So, you know, a young 25-year-old Hungarian, I mean, he's been to Western Europe. He's seen it. He knows it. But he's got opportunities here as well. And, um, you know, this this is, again, true of those that are perhaps more educated, more globally connected. You have, of course, some challenges because some of the older generation or those with less education simply aren't able to get, let's say, the better jobs, and there's a lot of social challenges in some in some respects, uh, even, uh, especially among some of the older, a, a certain nostalgia for the old days. Uh, uh, I mean, it's it's hard to imagine, you know, communism was better, uh, but the reality is for, for many, communism gave everybody a job and gave everybody a piece of bread, and now uh, the world they're in today means you got to actually work for it, and you have to kind of be a little more proactive than, 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 than in the past. Yeah, and you know, you've mentioned a number of times uh, the connection or the involvement of the EU in this whole process. And I wonder if you could sort of, um, you know, tell us how 
Hungary and the Czech Republic got involved in the EU, whether there was resistance by the other members of the EU, as there ha has been sometimes with entering countries, yeah. uh, and what it has done, not only for the economy, but the sense of connection with the rest of Europe uh, and, and the kind of vitality you're talking about. It sounds like the EU phenomenon has been fabulous. And I guess I would also ask, you know, has, has uh, the Czech Republic and Hungary, have they suffered in the way that Greece and Spain have suffered uh, by reason of the meltdown of a couple of years ago? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, let me begin by saying, I mean, we, we have to understand the context. The, the EU as we know it today formally comes into effect in 1993, so shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall. But in fact, it really began in the 1950s, a group of six uh, countries, you know, mainly France and Germany, uh, as well as Italy and the ben Benelux. But over the 60s and 70s, it began to expand so that by the early 90s, you had 15 members, and it was mostly Western and Northern Europe. Well, the critical year for this region of Central and Eastern Europe is 2004, 10 years ago. So it's a watershed right now uh, as we look at it. In 2004, 10 new members, the largest expansion of the European Union occurs, uh, and this is primarily eight of the ten are, are these regions of Central and Eastern Europe, the, the Baltic states in the north, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Slovenia, Poland. Uh, 2004, two years later, you had Romania and Bulgaria. So just quick context that these are countries that joined at that time. Now, in order to join, they had to demonstrate at least, well, three main criteria. They had to have a functioning democracy. And so over the, you know, from 89 to about 2000 and early 2000s, you know, a process of about 15 years, these countries made that transition, became democracies, and that involved a lot of things. They also had to have, number two, a functioning market economy of some kind, a banking system that worked, you know, certain control of the macro economy, etc. So these countries, by and large, did so quite well. Now, they did it with a lot of help. The EU provided a lot of funding, a lot of training and expertise, and they had to harmonize their economies. Uh, the final part, I perhaps I just mentioned it, the third criteria is that all the countries that join the EU have to agree to accept all the rules and laws and treaties, and so they become full-fledged members. Uh, now, I think the short answer is that the European Union integration has been certainly a big plus for these countries, and I think the best example would be the case of Poland. Here's a country that neighbors uh, Ukraine, and that if you were looking at a snapshot 30 years ago, they had per capita incomes that were pretty close, you know, pretty low developed, you know, communist countries. You fast forward 30 years and today Poland has three times the per capita income of Ukraine. Poland is very dynamic and, and clearly integrated. Now, integrated in Western, and if you will, uh, you know, just a, a higher level of development on, on any measure. The Spain well, Union has brought them a lot of foreign investment uh, and it was something that by and large, more for geopolitical reasons, uh, it was a no-brainer that you know, these countries become part of the West. But for economic reasons, it opened up a larger market so that obviously people, you know, companies in Germany or in other parts of Western Europe, they saw tremendous opportunity for investments and, and, and it's done them very well. Bigger markets, bigger opportunities. Um, now, having said all that, I want to make clear the e EU has a lot of challenges and, and you know, you see this in many countries. I mean, the fact that they are now more and more interdependent means that other countries that may have some suffering challenges, everyone has to bear that cost. So Greece has a meltdown a few years ago, and you know I've done travels. I was in Slovenia last fall, and there's a lot of frustration even in that tiny country down in Slovenia that they end up having to pay some of that bill to bail out the Greeks. But I'll tell you in general, uh, while there's a grumbling about the European Union, the over bureaucratization. Um, and I, w I will say there's a qualified, you know, they like the EU, but they also want to maintain some of their own identity somewhat. And so, um, you know, that takes on different forms. Uh, but by and large, it's been positive. And, you know, for those that were already in, the 15 members that, you know, were already in, I think there was not a lot of resistance to it. There was more concern in the far cases of Romania and Bulgaria. That's why they took a little longer. And also the last member to join one year ago exactly was Croatia. So today the EU has 28 member states and uh, you know this region of Central and Eastern Europe has been 
joined in the last 10 years, uh, Croatia just last year, and uh, you know it's it's a done deal. And and despite all the economic crisis we've seen, I mean these countries are now so interconnected that it's it's hard to imagine, uh, I guess, uh, any option that's outside of that for them. Well, uh, you know, Carlos, I'd like to take a short break, uh, but then yes. we'll come back. I want to talk more with you about uh, the identity issue, identity versus trans-Europeanness that we have now. Yes. And I also want to talk about, about the baggage, if any, uh, that was left behind by that period in which they were communists and yes, how, that, yes. how that shadows their going forward. Absolutely. That's Carlos Juarez, a professor at HBU who's uh, taking some time in the Czech Republic and in Hungary. And he's in Budapest now. He joins us at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, by Skype. And we are delighted to be able to talk to him and debrief him about his trip. This is Think Tech Talks, Global Connections. We'll be right back. Okay, this is Think Tech. And one of our favorite shows is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And it, it uh, goes 4 to 5 every Wednesday right here from Think Tech. Uh, in Pioneer Plaza at the core of downtown Honolulu. And my co-host is Ray Starling from Hawaii Energy. Ray, do you like the show? I love the show. It's, uh, it's great to see all the new people coming in with new ideas about how to save energy, get us off of fossil fuel, and that's what it's all about. So Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Uh, see us on Wednesday afternoons at 4 o'clock. I knew he'd say that. Thanks, Ray. Here we go. Here we go. We're back. We're live. We're here on Think Tech Global Connections on a Thursday in the two to three block with Carlos Juarez, who is normally our host and who speaks to us today uh, through Skype in uh, Budapest, Hungary, where he is uh, attending a conference involving Hungary and the Czech, Czech Republic. And he, we really appreciate him joining us at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, anyway, uh, Carlos, uh, you look remarkably well for somebody who got up to or stayed up to do a show like this, and we really appreciate that. Uh, but I think it's a kind of convention we want to do over and over again. It's really wonderful to have a, a report from the front. So the a question of identity, you know, the, Europe has changed so much. It's hard to believe, uh, you know, how it's sort of come together and it's risen to new, new visions uh, since the war and actually just in the last few years. It's quite remarkable to go there and feel the vitality. And you can do that, but at the same time, you know, you, you still want to find that uh, the identity question, what is it like to be a Hungarian? What is it like these days to be from the Czech, a Czech from the Czech Republic and so forth? And, and how does the, the history of the place, especially the dark history of uh, communist uh, suppression, uh, how does that affect the way they are, the way they think, the way they conduct themselves right now? Well, yeah, this is a, a real, you know, a critical part of this whole issue because on one hand I've said how these are countries now deeply integrated, deeply in interconnected and part of the European Union, part of this larger European identity. But at the at the other end, you really see this throughout the region of, 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 of this part of the world, but there's a, a, a deep desire to want to make sure not to lose what makes them distinct, what makes them Hungarian or, or Czech. And, and one thing that is so clear, uh, especially in this part of the world, is uh, the importance of history, the importance of you know who they are and not forgetting it. Uh, and so I think this is true of the European Union. It's also true of globalization in general, where there's this deeper interconnectedness, but part of a pushback that says, well, wait a minute, we're not all the same. On one hand, we are, but we have to you know, make sure we know who we are. The other is that part of the process of democracy that's, that's now consolidated here has meant, look, you have protection of minority rights so that people can assert their cultural values. And, and so these are countries that are not entirely homogeneous. You know, although hung Hungary has, you know, 85 percent, 90 percent Hungarians, they have some important minority groups. One of the biggest, of course, are Roma, the gypsies, as they're known here as Roma. And this is a challenge uh, because they're often marginalized. But in many other countries, or, or let's just stick to Hungary, for example, while they are all here, one of the challenges they face is there are many, many Hungarians because of history and the drawing of borders that are living in Romania, living in Slovenia, living in Austria, in neighboring countries. And so, you know, how do you reconcile that? Because these are people that want to maintain that identity. The other is just, I mean, I often ask this myself and, and, and of others, is there a European identity? And I mean, on one level, I think there is. And yet Europeans are very clear to say, well, no, first time in, you know, Austrian or a Hungarian. But even deeper than that, 
you see a growing sense of regionalism now, so people often identify more with their more immediate region. They may be Transylvanian or they may be Tyrolean from you know a certain part of Austria, or in the case of Czech Republic, they could be Moravian from the east. And mm -hmm. so this, you know, in part this this deepening uh, of integration has also force people to kind of push back and say, well, no, I want to make sure and not forget who I am as an individual and what makes me slightly different from that other person over there. Well, this is popular around the world, you know, to return to one's roots and uh, trek, uh, respect and treasure, you know, the history of it. But I wonder if you could give us a profile, uh, you know, if you could distinguish, say, the profile of a person who lives in Hawaii and a person who lives in in Budapest, uh, what, you know, what, what, what am I going to, what should I expect in meeting a person from Budapest? How will I be surprised or delighted or what have you? Well, a couple of things. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's an interesting question. Um, uh, I would say that, you know, certainly a Hungarian and true of many other Europeans is, you know, their history is just so deep in, in, in their sort of identity in their mindset. They know where they come from and it doesn't take much. You look around the corner and you see this incredible palace that was built in, you know, whatever century and, you know, and, and so the people grow up here understanding that and they learn their history, they know it. Uh, and to me that's of course as a social scientist, I mean that's exciting. I, I get frustrated when our, you know, unfortunately our students couldn't find Hungary on a map when uh, somehow, uh, you know, Hungarians now, they have their own history and of course, uh, you know, everybody writes their own so that will vary and, and there's often some sensitive issues issues here and there but so that historical context I think gives them a sense of, of who they are uh, there's a rich appreciation of art and culture and and you know things like music I mean it's just anywhere you go I mean even the smallest town will have a little music hall and they'll have you know theater and opera um, beyond that I mean I think uh, you know, there's a certain etiquette I think that is probably characteristic. Where you know, of course, Hawaii, we're very laid back, and 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 we have you know this sort of you know friendly aloha spirit, uh, but we're very informal. And I would say there's a little bit more of a formality here, especially in social norms. You know, there's a certain etiquette, a certain way of doing things. And believe me, they've been doing things a long time. And so, you know, whatever you make of it, you have to appreciate that these are you know people that have a rich history, and um, they're actually re you know finding it and polishing it up a little bit because it's always been there although they have experienced in recent decades some periods of really you know dark uh, you know the communist period in particular was just a really challenging uh, thing for them they are that's now behind them and yet that legacy remains how does it remain Carlos I mean where do you see it where do you see it visited where where do you see those shadows live in in the in the profile of somebody from Hungary or the Czech Republic you see the dark no. shadows because you know that came from yeah. that time. Well, it's interesting. I mean, there are different ways you could see it in in just the built environment. On one hand, you look and you see these fantastic buildings that were built in the nineteenth, eighteenth, seventeenth century, and then you turn around and you say, "Oh, that's from the communist era," you know, built in nineteen sixty two, and it's just usually some god awful gray you know, <laughs> uh, matchbox thing. So, just in terms of that, you see, you know, some evidence or, you know, some of the decay of some of these buildings. Now, many are being restored and have been, but, you know, essentially there was a long neglect, you might say. Mm -hmm. But the other areas that are a little more subtle and maybe more sensitive is when the transfer of power happened, when the communists, you know, basically left office, so to speak, they were revolutions in one sense, but on another sense, I would argue they were not. That is, they didn't really expel all of them. And, and in the Czech Republic, where I was last week, uh, and again, even here in Hungary, many of those who were part of the old system, uh, especially those that are more mid-level, um, they remained, and they simply changed the color of their tie, they became a new party, they, they sort of redefined themselves, but uh, the legacy is still there in that sometimes issues will come up like, hey, well, what were you doing back in the 70s and 80s, and now you're still in power? And so some of it is the, the corruption that was so endemic, and, and believe me, the communist system was very corrupt. It was a very uh, sort of, uh, you know, you were either in, you know, in power and had all the control, and those networks still remain, and that's where you see it evident, the, the legacy of that. I think the last point I would make, which is uh, also hard to measure, but it's very real, in the mindset. You can tell that certainly people, uh, this whole game of democracy is relatively new for them, even though they had a few brief periods you know, before World War II, for the most part, the whole idea of expressing anything you want or having fundamental rights and liberties, I mean, this is a new concept. And so for the older generation who lived through the communist period, 
um, you know, it's got to be a challenge just how you come to terms with that. Like, you know, what's acceptable and what's not in terms of your behavior. Yeah, how do you, how do you compare it with uh, democracy in this country, especially the evolving democracy where people feel free and are free to protest and uh, agitate and uh, oppose government policies, uh, criticize publicly and all that, I mean, the First Amendment, uh, you know, in every way. So do those kinds of things happen in this part of the world, too? Absolutely. And, and I, I mean, my first thought would be, I think in the West and particularly the United States, you know, we often just take for granted, you know, you've always had this and you, you don't, in fact, we have relatively low levels of participation. And that either means one of two things, people are apathetic or not, you know, not really plugged in or connected. Maybe in a few cases, some people argue it means that everything's okay. Why bother? You know, you don't have to vote because it's not going to make a big difference. But maybe what I would say is in this part of the world where you have relatively new democracies now, 20, 20, 25 years since they left communism, I would say 10 or 15 years since they consolidated democracy, I think that they value it a lot. And they, especially the generation who lived through communism, I mean, they know that it's much better to have a free and open society. Um, perhaps the younger population, this is probably true more of what we see in the U.S., those that grew up after 1989, they don't know that past in the same way. But nevertheless, I would say there's a very, I think, a very, very genuine um, excitement that they live in democracies today where they can express their views in a way where they have certain rights guaranteed um, and uh, you know there's a certain I think still a bit of a honeymoon however I also note this you know the political scientist in me also sees that the honeymoon in some ways is over and and that same democracy that they now have is also opened and is more transparent you can see a lot of the ugly stuff underneath more and uh, and that's where you still have some contentious issues, you know, especially about what were you doing in 1985 or, or you know, where were you uh, during the communist period? Yeah, that sounds like one of the more interesting inquiries you can make in an area, especially with your background, you can take a look and see, uh, you know, how people enter the new democracy of our time. But yeah. I, you know, wonder also, you know, you know, our generation was raised uh, on war movies about World War II. And mm -hmm. these parts of Europe were frequently uh, subject in those war movies, and we saw them through the lens of those movies. And you know, in the in the context of the war, we we had a feeling of uh, oppressed people who were, uh, you know, constantly in trouble with people who would oppress them. And um, <clears throat> and I wonder if that if that also casts a shadow on modern day Hungary or uh, or Czech Republic, um, or, it, or or have they have they gotten past that now? And it is simply not part of their national thinking. You know, I, I think it's a little bit of both. On one hand, it doesn't consume people's daily, you know, lives. They're on, they're busy, you know, they're part of the new open societies they live in. But even today, I visited here in Budapest the, the Terror Museum, as they call it. And, it. and it is an effort on their part to say, hey, let's not forget. Let's not forget what happened here. And here's the record. And it's an ugly one. And it's dark. And it's sensitive. So they make sure not to forget it. It's very much real in there. But even because of that, I think, in part, it's very sensitive and somewhat taboo. Uh, you have to be careful. You know, you're not going to say the wrong thing. And, 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 you know, especially for those who perhaps have lived through it. Anybody who's over, you know, 50, uh, who, who really was a, you know, full-fledged adult and saw what the communist system was like, um, you know, uh, they, you know, in some cases you have to be careful that uh, you don't say something inappropriate. But, no, I, I want to say in general it doesn't consume them, but, of course, coming here as an outsider myself and in the capacity of this program, yes, I mean, this, that's what it's all about, the transition, what it was like. So, uh, over and over people are, on one hand, constantly saying, gosh, well, this is how it was in the communist days. I mean, today I had a briefing from the education ministry. Well, this is how we used to do it. This is how we do it now. So it's certainly there. And, and yet uh, I would say, uh, for the most part, everybody is relieved that it's behind them uh, and, and very much dealing with the here and now and looking to a better future. Carlos, are you getting, are you getting candid conversations? Are people yes. leveling with you on how they feel? I mean, can you have a little schnapps with them? And, and see into their souls? Do you get, do you get that far? 
you can, and this is why it requires coming and visiting. I mean, you may not get that right at the opening. You know, we we have some very formal you know meetings here. We'll visit a, you know, again, especially a government agency, and they have a prepared you know presentation, and so you're not going to get it there. But this is why it's so vital. You know, you have a lunch meeting with them, or you get to know them better, even the hosts that we have, and then you know people certainly do. They don't hesitate to share their personal views, and and you have to. This is where it's critical. I think anywhere you go in the world, you have to know a little bit about the history yourself. I mean, I'm learning more of it, but you know, I'm certainly relatively familiar with what's been going on here in the past, you know, century. Uh, and so, knowing that, you also then have to know, you know, where people might be coming from, because again, depending on where they sit or what, you know, what their experience might have been, they're going to have very different. Uh, take on things. Uh, and there's not one simple narrative. There are obviously different stories and you see it play out in the political system here. These are very, I would say, fluid political party systems and, and they're often led by individuals more than sort of the parties that are more common in some other you know, European countries and those individuals often it's the narrative that they're giving you know are they staunchly anti-communist or are they more sort of socialist and have a communist uh, it's People do open up and share very candidly. I think there's no question that there's an openness. There's no fear that people can't say what's on their mind. Mm, good. Uh, you know, I was thinking that you know, where it comes together for me is I see two generations uh, in this part mm -hmm. of Europe. You know, one one is the generation that has a, a living history of um, you know World War II and uh, the communist uh, regime, and yes. then there's then there's a generation of now, and the generation of now is the one. These are the guys who uh, fully appreciate the EU. They you know, they bond up to it, they look to it, they travel now that they can all over Europe. Every spare shekel they spend traveling and learning and become, mm -hmm. you know, trans-European. Uh, they, uh, they are into the Internet. Uh, they are, you know, they're, they're into the kinds of things that we are into here. Uh, they're a modern global community of young people, and they are the ones who are going to take Hungary and the Czech Republic forward, you know, regardless of what the earlier generation has to say. But am I right about that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, so you do have a generational divide, if you want to call it that. I mean, uh, it, it definitely is there and alive and well. And and I mean, the other part, I said this briefly earlier, there's a real pronounced difference. Those, those who I would say today are under 25, let's say, uh, who really grew up in the only world they've known is, you know, basically this felt relatively open and deeply, you know, increasingly integrated world. Uh, the young population, the college student today, I mean, they are, they see themselves as just another European, and, and that's not the world their parents and grandparents grew up in at all. Uh, they just didn't have that mobility, uh, and uh, so that affects their mindset, clearly. Uh, I mean, they just take for granted certain things, and I think, you know, much like in the U.S., we have those that grew up, you know, from the Depression, they had a certain set of values and, you know, fr frugality and thriftness. Um, you know, those who grew up here in this communist period in the recent past, I mean, they uh, both appreciate today's world that's more open, but they're also, I think, a little more, uh, I don't know, I guess uh, they probably still have a legacy of that kind of, you know, uh, you know, looking behind your shoulder, or being very careful, perhaps, you know, and, and where I think that plays out is, you know, I've asked a lot of people, you know, the take on, you know, Russia today and its role in Ukraine and, you know, and people here have very strong views about the Russians because it's not an abstract thing. I mean, uh, Russian tanks were here in, in Budapest in 1956 and, and, you know, the same with, you know, the German uh, Nazis that, that were here. Today they come as foreign investors and the Russians come as tourists, but the the legacy of that past still shapes their views of the people. Sure, I mean, and really you would expect that and it wasn't that long ago and it was profound. But what about other world events? What about other world sea changes that um, you know that we here in this country read about all the time? You know, what's you know, for example, does the average person in Budapest, in Hungary, in the Czech Republic, does he follow the events of the Middle East? Does he follow the events uh, in Africa? You know, including the very troubling ones that are happening these days, uh, or is that just too far away for for him to to spend the time and thought on? Well, I, I want to say, and again, here it will vary. I mean, if we're talking to a you know a less 
you know, educated person, of course not, but that's true in the U.S. But those who are more, you know, of these globally connected and, you know, college students, they certainly do. They, they know what's happening to, as we speak right now in Israel and Palestine and, and, and you know, Syria is a very real issue. Uh, the other thing is that they are informed by a perspective that's certainly different from ours. They, they know ours because they see, they watch CNN and, and yet they also watch, you know, other news outlets. And so they get, I think, a, you know, a different perspective, uh, as skewed as it may be, or, or just different. Um, but I would say in general, because they're also, the young population I'm speaking about here, relatively eager to be part of this new globally connected world, they are. Now, probably coming from Hawaii where, you know, we live there, a little less focus on Asia, although they hear it and know it, but but their world here is defined, the Middle East is not very far, and, and you know, it, it, it impacts them more directly, and Russia and Ukraine is right next door, so those are very much on the front, you know, pages, uh, if you will. Um, but I would say in general, yes, and, and the more educated adults, I mean, they're plugged in, and, and they do manage today to stay informed about these, you know, What, world what about other, you know, conceptual things and scientific things? Are they uh, are they talking about? Are they dwelling on? Are they uh, you know uh, making traction on public uh, involvement over climate change, uh, the environment, uh, social justice and equality? You know the kinds of things that occupy so much of our time in this country. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you sense the same sensitivity over there? Yeah, on one hand, I, I'm going to say yes, especially this is really part of the new democracy that they are here. You know, and to, uh, you know, of course, that's part of what I'm looking at in great detail in this program. But um, you know, they are definitely more focused on what they would call, or we would call, maybe civil rights and and, and human rights. Um, uh, it was curious today at a briefing. There was a, gosh, I guess it's called like a Ministry of National. What did they call it? In fact, it was a puzzling name because they, they passed a new constitution here in Hungary in the last one or two years, and they have a new fundamental law, it's called. And the Germans call it a basic law. It's their constitution. So they have this new agency, a ministry like an ombudsman, and it's designed to, you know, if people have not been able to get their problems solved through the system, this is like the, the one you go to, and it's designed to kind of protect your fundamental rights. And most of it are, you know, their minority rights, their sort of, you know, even environmental rights. So the main point I would say is that there is, uh, I think, uh, just a, a growing attention to these things, and they play out at the national level. So within Hungary, Czech Republic, you have that. But part of it is also part of the European Union dialogue, the Parliament in, in, in you know, Strasbourg, France, and, uh, and in Brussels, other institutions are. So some of that is taking place among the elites, let's say, and those who are involved in that. But you also have a real growth of NGOs, uh, something that didn't exist before under the communist rule. And these are places that have seen a tremendous spike of, of NGO activity. Well, it's that change, you know, the sea change coming from the old place to the new place that must be very exciting for you. And, and I wonder, uh, you know, I mean, it seems to me that that's, this is a place where a tourist, I mean, even a young tourist would love to go and, um, you know, uh, and see these changes, feel these changes, uh, you know, feel the new energy and, and, and make the contrast between the old and the new. And I let, if we, if we could just uh, imagine for a moment, Carlos, that you're, all your classes at HPU are here watching this video. What would you say to them? Should they go? Should they go to Hungary? Should they go to uh, Budapest? Should they go to the Czech Republic? Uh, and why? Absolutely. I mean, uh, my first answer would be yes. And and, and tonight, I, I was, you know, with the colleagues I have here in this program, there's such a, a very vast, and it's not just here, Budapest, many of these cities, uh, Prague, uh, Krakow, Poland, Ljubljana, Slovenia, these are places where the young population is got such a wealth of activities and you know music concerts and you know one of the big trendy things here is what they call ruin bars and and what that is is you know you've got these old beat up rusty buildings and so they're very expensive to renovate so what do you do you keep it like it is and you just put in a bar and so now you go out and you have you know a night out at this bar and it's just in the middle of this very gaudy ugly uh building but it's that's the trend uh, uh the other is you have some old churches that have been renovated and they've been turned into like you know discos but you know i think what, what i would say is that this is really a part of the world that has got so much uh, movement, uh, you know, not just Americans, and you see many, but 
student, student, young populations are here from Spain, from the Netherlands, from the UK. It's a real gathering place right now in a way that I would say is not quite what you're going to see in all of Western Europe. You'll still have in Berlin, of course, and Copenhagen. Those are big popular cities. But um, this is the place, and I would encourage anyone to come. Uh, we, uh, we have opportunities for some of our students to come on their own. Uh, myself, uh, one of the things I'll be looking at is an opportunity to bring a group here in the not-too-distant future. Uh, very exciting because they're, they're just, there's a lot of good energy here, uh, young, youthful energy. Oh, that sounds great. You know, it's a pocket of special things happening. You're there. You're able to tell us about it. Look forward to when you come back, you can tell us some more about it. That's Carlos Suarez of HPU, faculty there in a special conference in Budapest in uh, Hungary. And he's visiting there in the Czech Republic and reporting back to us between 2 and 3 in the morning uh, Budapest time. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Aloha. aloha. Tell them all aloha for us. <laughs> Aloha to you all here, and I'm uh, coming to you live from the future because it's already Friday here, but uh, much in the same way that this is a part of the world that rich in history, but it is so much part of the future now. This is a part of the world that is now deeply integrated into the West and to the rest. So uh, for those who have not made it, uh, it's not going anywhere. It's been here for a very long time. And, and it, I would encourage any of you who have opportunities, don't just go to the same Italy, France, and Spain. Those are certainly world, worthwhile. But this part of the world, I think, offers a lot more uh, interesting change and dynamism. Thank you, Carlos. Carlos Suarez. Thanks. Uh, global connections. Thanks so much.